I'm 6ABC health reporter and registered nurse, Allie Gorman, and you're listening to the True Philadelphia podcast with Matt O'Donnell. Allie Gorman has been a great resource for Action News in all things health and medical for 12 years. These days, her expertise is even more valued. Ali joined me on a Zoom connection to talk about why she was one of the first people at Action News to work from home during these stay-at-home orders, what her colleagues in the medical community are going through, if she fears we could be in a stuck situation for a while, and if she ever imagined she'd live through a pandemic. Right now on the True Philadelphia Podcast. You ready? I'm ready. I've never done a podcast before. But oh, you haven't? No, I wow. listen to them all the time, though. Well, you are getting indoctrinated right now. <laughs> it's going to be fun. <laughs> Allie Gorman, so good to see you. Fantastic to see you. I feel very separate from everybody. Yeah, well, truly right now. Um, I always like to start these in a biographical nature. Um, maybe some people don't know you are from this area. You're from South Jersey. You went to Eastern High School. Go Vikes. Go Vikings. Right. Yeah. Um, you went to Georgetown University. Then you went and joined the Navy. You were a nurse corps uh, officer. And then you said, hey, I'm going to go back to school again because I'm an overachiever. And you got a journalism master's degree at Northwestern. So what's the deal with all this stuff? You are an overachiever, aren't you? No, I don't know if it's that. I think that I get bored after a certain amount of time. So I think when I was in the Navy, I started to know that, oh, you know, maybe I want to do something a little bit different. Um, all the doctors and nurses were like, no, 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 give it, give it a year after the Navy, like go do civilian medicine, see what you think. But throughout that year, um, I kept kind of getting hints that like, oh, I think I want to try something a little bit different. So that's what I did. What sparked the idea of joining the Navy? Do you have family who are military or what was the deal? My dad was uh, in the Navy and you know, it's so weird because I was like 17, 18 years old when you make this big decision, but I was visiting Georgetown and the ROTC people were coming around kind of giving pamphlets. Uh, my dad was with me and was like, oh, look at this. Now, you know, for, of course they sell it to you like you're gonna see the world, um, which I really wanted to do. And I was really into um, athletics and stuff like that. So that's kind of what drew me into it. Um, truth be told, I really only saw uh, Chicago, but that's okay. <laughs> well, you were on a ship, right? I was on a ship, yes. I did 14 day uh, cruise on a ship uh, for training purposes. And um, that I know I couldn't have done long term because I was horribly seasick the entire time. So you're not a cruise ship person, like and I'm talking like carnival and stuff like that. Oh, no, no. And especially now. Yes. yes. So uh, you've been working at home probably more than anyone else at the station. And I know there's a reason why you started doing that a little earlier. Can you kind of go into a little bit of detail on that? Yeah, so, and I think, you know, we all knew at some point we were gonna start working from home. There were some contingency plans, but um, early, mid-March, uh, I won't go into too many details, but I have a close contact who woke up with all the classic signs of COVID-19. Um, high fever, no congestion, dry cough, body aches. Um, they called the doctor, went into the doctor. The doctor was able to rule out other things, could not rule out COVID-19, but also couldn't test for it at the time. Um, so that doctor told me like, hey, you know, we need to assume that this is what it is and you've been exposed. So you need to quarantine yourself for 14 days. So as a nurse and a science person, I was kind of frustrated because it's like, you want that proof. Um, but, you know, I, I understood and I understood the gravity of it as well. I, I'm sure everyone has their own little grievances with working at home and then there are maybe some advantages. What are some of those for you? Yeah, so it's difficult. Um, you do feel like you're working much more than you would be if you were actually going into the station, you know, your eight and a half hour shift. I feel like I'm pretty much working from the time I wake up until time I put the computer away at, after the 1130 show. Um, I'm also a very proud foster parent. So uh, I have a little one that I'm taking care of. And during those 14 days, it was just me and the little one also doing the broadcasts. So that was obviously challenging. So I, I understand parents working from home, like 
it's no joke. Uh, yeah. Very difficult. Yeah. Uh, the benefit, though, I can say, like, you know, I after the 1130, you know, Jim says, all right, thanks, Allie. And I can pretty much be in bed in, in 10 minutes, you know, take off my makeup, put on my pajamas and, and I'm in bed. So there's the advantage. There's the advantage. <laughs> so you're a registered nurse. I mean, you're you're out there. You do this still. Um, what are some of the things that we don't hear enough about what people are going through in these hospitals and wherever they're treating COVID patients and just regular people, too? Yeah, I mean, full disclosure, I've not been a floor nurse for a very long time, and I have um, nothing but complete respect for the people on the front lines um, doing this. I think the one thing that that hits me, and I still have many friends in the healthcare field that are on the front line, so I've been kind of texting with them, um, you know, throughout the day. People have talked about this, but the thing that just really kind of just hits me is, um, I have friends who are nurses who it is not a profession. It is a calling for them. They are true caregivers. They went into this because they want to give the absolute best care to their patients. And what kind of breaks my heart is because of what's going on, it's very difficult to do that. You've got this PPE, which you obviously need, but it is very restrictive and it really creates a barrier, not just a physical barrier, but an emotional barrier with the patients. And then, you know, a patient, you know, maybe, towards the end of life and not being able to have their family next to them, you know, and hold their hand skin to skin. Um, I know for families, that's devastating. I also know for healthcare workers, that is traumatizing because you don't feel like you are giving that patient and the family the very best because you can't because of the circumstances. I would imagine more so than maybe any other industry, being a nurse, being a doctor is because you love it. You truly do. I think you have to. I think you have to. And I think a lot of this stuff, I know when I was working as a floor nurse, um, I would take that stuff home with me. You know, if there was a patient who was doing well and then I'd come in and, you know, things had turned and, and they were they were really sick. I mean, I would, this is when I would get on the subway in New York, I would, I, I would almost be in tears because I would just be so upset. It's just yeah, you want, you want to do your best, but you also kind of you want the best for the patients and the families. So January is three months ago, and it seems like 30 years. But if I could get you to try and take your mind back to January, this is before the United States had its first confirmed case, when we really didn't know where this was going. Do you remember what your fears were at that point and what your mindset and your thinking was as to where this could go? Yeah, and as I, I was thinking about this because I was trying to remember kind of the timeline of stuff. But honestly, I think in January, when we were just hearing about cases over in Wuhan or travel related cases um, as that got going, there was a lot of we, you know, we just don't know. And I'm not an overreactor. So a lot of the epidemiologists that I was interviewing, a lot of the infectious disease doctors I was interviewing, were still saying like, hey, you know, we don't know. You know, right now we're just seeing travel related cases. Um, I will say that we listened to a teleconference from the CDC every week. And there was a point, and I want to say it was like mid-February, um, and they were kind of not downplaying things, but they were very realistic about things. But about mid-February, there was a change in, um, there was a change in tone that you could tell. Now they weren't saying like, hey, we're seeing community spread. They were still saying we're not seeing community spread. Um, but here was where some of the top experts, the CDC, who started to say, hey, we need to start making some plans for if this starts to take off. Um, and, you know, Producer uh, Don Hefner and I, we both, she sits in a different office. We both kind of came out and we're like, huh, that was different, right? Uh, so that was like the first time that I was like, oh, okay. Um, because I think January, and I was even saying it, you know, the, our biggest risk at that time was the flu. The flu was still um, really active and there were, you know, tens of thousands of people die from the flu every year. People kind of stopped paying attention to the flu. Um, so there was just no telling as to whether it was just going to continue to be the flu or if we were going to start to see this community spread. But I will say that teleconference is what started to change my mind that uh -oh, we could be looking at something big here. As someone who's worked in the health profession, 
did you ever imagine that you in your lifetime would see a full on world pandemic? I don't think so. I don't think I, I did. Um, in all honesty, I, I've read so many books on stuff like this. Um, and I was, you know, as awful as these are, there, there's a sense that's kind of interesting just to watch kind of what's happening and how research plays out. Um, and with H1N1, I mean, I dug into all of that research. But no, I mean, I saw the movie Contagion, and uh, as scary as it is, I didn't think that we'd ever see it. Now, obviously, it's not that as bad as Contagion, but I did not think that we would see a pandemic. Although, I don't know. I mean, I, I listened to I listened to TED talks from Bill Gates, um, from another researcher who was involved with uh, smallpox, I think. So I don't know why. Maybe I was just in denial, but I guess I. I Definitely didn't think we would see it anytime soon. Sure. So I, I, at the risk of dating this podcast, this is April 20th when we're recording this. Do you worry that we're going to be stuck for quite a while where maybe we lift some restrictions and then a lot of people get it and then we have to pull it back and it's sort of like this cat and mouse game? I do. Um, unfortunately, I think they're going to have to keep looking at the numbers and the numbers have to go down significantly before they start um, lifting some of the restrictions. An issue that I have as well, or a fear, I should say, is they're going to start lifting some of the restrictions, but we're getting close to summertime. So it's going to be nice out. And I think you give people an inch and they're going to take a mile mm -hmm. and you can't see a virus. So it's very easy to be like, oh, we're fine. We're fine. And then, you know, a group of three turns into a group of 20. And yeah, we could start to see another wave of infections. And without the, uh, the contact tracing kind of in place, then I, I think we could get right back to, to where we were, you know, last week or, or the week before. Sure. I love watching Ask Alley on Action News where you know, Rick Williams or whoever gets to ask you whatever they want. Um, you did talk a little bit about some of these conspiracy theories that are going around. One, which is completely not true, that it was actually invented in a lab, which, as you know, viruses, they, they just don't work that way. Uh, I saw recently that someone from this Wuhan laboratory actually came out and said, listen, it didn't come from us. We didn't misuse, you know, our equipment or accidentally expose someone who went out and, you know, set this thing on fire. What did you think about that when you heard about that? I didn't hear of him going out and saying that, um, but I've heard these conspiracy theories and I've been hearing them for a while. Um, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist at all. I, I look at the research and the science, um, but I understood the suspicion because then you start to look at like, wow, there's this big laboratory in Wuhan where they study coronaviruses. Uh, but everything that I read were the researchers coming out and saying, hey, we're looking at this virus. There is no evidence it was man-made. All the evidence points to it being a naturally occurring virus. Um, but I didn't, I didn't hear about that worker um, in Wuhan, but that's interesting. Uh, are, do you think we'll ever find patient zero, especially given this is China and this is not necessarily a country that is very open with its information? Probably not, probably not. And I think that I think that even the early infections, I think there were probably some infections even before that, that uh, just kind of went under the radar and it is flu season. So they might've been, you know, not tested for flu, but just kind of assumed that it's flu or another upper respiratory infection. This might've been around for several months already by the time we got to December. I think so. And I do think, you know, the time that I was told to quarantine, um, even without the test, I was kind of like, you know what, I think that there was more community spread than we knew of at that point. And because we weren't testing, there's no way of, of saying for sure. So you probably know, in fact, you do know someone who has COVID-19 or is a suspected case. I know people who have it. There is such a wide range in what it does to people. Why is that? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I know for one thing, it could be just kind of the what you're exposed to in terms of the virus. So, you know, say you're exposed to something on a, a grocery store bag, someone had it and they touched it and then you touch it and then you touch your face. That wouldn't be a huge number of particles. So that wouldn't be a lot of virus. But if someone who has it um, and coughs and sneezes in your face, 
uh, or you're spending a lot of time with them, then that's a lot of virus um, that your body would have. So I think that right there is going to set you up for a more um, severe infection. And then I think just our bodies are different in terms of how we respond to different infections. Some of the cases that have been very severe, it's not, in, it's not exactly the infection, but it's the body's response to that infection. And in some of these cases, it's almost an over response of the immune system, which is what's making people so sick. That's the catechetine storm. Not, yeah, cytokines, yeah. Yeah, cytokine storm, yeah, yeah. Where the immune system goes haywire, thinking it's protecting the body, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah we, yeah, we don't know why. I mean, obviously, for some people, we know why that's happening. But for some people, we don't know, you know, why their body is reacting the way that it is. And it might be that they were exposed to, a, you know, a large number of virus particles. Yeah, so it could just be sheer volume. I mean, that would make a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now people are getting sores where they, dermatologists think that people who have COVID-19 are, are getting sores, some as bad as like a, what it looks like frostbite. And does that tell you that this virus is rapidly adapting and changing and doing these, these things very quickly? In all honesty, I have not seen that. I, I haven't heard that. Um, so I, I can't really respond to that. Well, I well, do well, think, what's that? Ahead, I do think that this virus is, I mean, one, it's awful. And I think Jim said this, if it wasn't so awful, it would be somewhat fascinating because it is so odd um, the way that it is um, kind of infecting people. I mean, for one, there are people who are walking around that have no symptoms whatsoever and are still infectious. That happens with the flu a little bit, you know, a couple of days before. Um, but typically most viruses, you have to have at least like some symptoms for it to be infectious. The other thing is just kind of the wide range of how it's affecting people. Yeah, some people are not having any symptoms. Some people may be a mild illness. Other people, it's attacking their lungs right away. Other people, it's getting to their heart right away. So it's something different for each patient, um, which I think is kind of what doctors and researchers are learning and looking at and trying to, there's no actual protocol as to how to treat it. They have to look at the patient and how their body is responding. With Ebola, I think the kill rate was 40%, which is immense. And that actually contained the spread because people were dying before they can get anyone else infected. And it was clear that someone was infected. With this coronavirus, it's super effective because for one, the asymptomatic period of two weeks sometimes and it's not it, its fatality rate is not as high as say ebola and so if you wanted to build the perfect virus this would be in that category wouldn't it i think viruses are smart um they basically yeah they don't want to go to a host and just kill the host because then they die off they want to infect a large number of people and yeah this virus is able to do that in a very sneaky way by one, being contagious before people even know that it's there, infecting some people and giving them no symptoms. I mean, Ebola was pretty difficult to catch because it had to be bodily fluids. Um, something like this, I mean, it can just be, you know, close contact with somebody. It's, it's similar to the flu, so it's a lot easier to spread as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of people bring up the earlier uh, pandemics, if you will, uh, not at this, the level that this is, but you had SARS, you had MERS, you had H1N1, Ebola, West Nile, and people would say, well, we didn't shut down the whole world for these things. Why is this different? Why is this different, Allie? Yeah, I mean, I think that it comes back to the virus and what makes it different. And it is that people are infectious before or even when they do not show any symptoms. Um, so I think it's able to infect a large number of people. And we know that the social distancing is the only way to get control of it right now. Uh, with SARS and with MERS, people uh, had to have symptoms in order for them to be infectious. H1N1, um, people were infectious a couple of days before their symptoms started. I think with that one, they just found that it, it actually wasn't as deadly. Um, it was deadly. I think it was, it was a severe um, flu season and you know I don't want to diminish there's you know what hundred more than a hundred thousand lives sure. lost to H1N1 um, but I think with this one they're just seeing it spread so rapidly and they're seeing some people get very very sick very quickly 
Another apples to oranges analogy, which is poor, is comparing the numbers we have with COVID-19 to say seasonal flu. And what I always try to think about is, well, what if we didn't have the social distancing? How much worse would it be? How much worse would this be with zero social distancing? I think it would be awful. I think if you listen to some of our top infectious disease experts, I think that, you know, in Philadelphia, we're not at capacity yet for the hospitals. And I think that is because when they started the social distancing and the stay at home orders, I think that that has kind of held that off. I think if no one did that, um, I think that we would see all of our hospitals completely overwhelmed. So, you know, look at some of the ones that are in New York City that are overwhelmed. Think about that for, you know, all major cities. You see some of the protests are going on around the country. There's one in Harrisburg the day that you and I are speaking. Do you worry that the, the pressure from certain parts of our population may be so immense that health officials may have no other choice but to roll back some things even against their better judgment? I don't know. You know, I understand people getting weary of stuff. I understand business owners, um, you know, losing, losing business and livelihoods. In the same sense, I think that if it affects somebody in their family or a lot, or they have a loved one that works in a hospital, I think they would see things in a different way. So I don't know. I just hope that people can kind of be more patient and realize that we're not just talking about numbers when we talk about the cases and the deaths. We're talking about you know, people, and we're talking about people's loved ones. Um, and it's, you know, it's not just the, it's not just older and with medical conditions, we're seeing perfectly healthy 30, 40 year olds um, get severely sick. So that's my hope. I, I get it. I understand that people are getting weary of it, but I think that for, you know, to save lives, we kind of need to be patient and we need to work together. Yeah, don't jump off the ship until you're docked at shore, right? That's right. Yeah. So we need a vaccine, we need a treatment that definitely works, and we need a massive increase in testing. What are you most hopeful about with those three things? Uh, I think the va I mean, I, I'm hopeful for a vaccine, but I know that's gonna take at least a year, at least a year. Um, I'm hoping with the contact tracing, I'm hoping that they can have some sort of system where I think the testing is getting better. You know, when we have the saliva test that they could mail to someone's home and you can do it through a virtual visit with your doctor. Um, the nasal swab testing are, are becoming more available. I'm hoping that as soon as someone has symptoms or has been exposed, they can be tested right away. And then you find out everybody who um, has possibly had exposure. And then those people need to stay home at least 14 days. That's what they did with Ebola in Liberia. And when you look at that, it did work. It takes a huge number. It, it takes a lot of manpower to get this done. Uh, but I think that there are different technologies that are working on trying to make this more efficient. And I was thinking, you know, we probably need to get creative. We need to get not just rely on our public health systems, but maybe employers need to kind of start a little team and they're, they're going to be the, con the contact tracer team. Um, and then I am hopeful about the antibody testing. The only thing with that is I just don't think it has been uh, proven to be accurate yet. And then we also don't know, even if you have antibodies, we don't know for sure that you are indeed immune. And if you are, we don't know how long that immunity lasts. I'm hopeful for that though. I am hopeful that they're gonna find that if somebody has those antibodies, that they are in fact immune, that they can't be reinfected. And then they can be out in the community and they can be kind of helping to, to rebuild. But we're just, we're not there yet. Sure. Allie Gorman, this was great to talk to you. What a great conversation. I have a question. Who's diving in that picture to your left? It's so funny. I'm getting like all these um, <laughs> Twitter comments about asking about the pictures behind me. And I've had that for years. I never even looked until someone on Twitter asked me. So it is called, hang on. It is called Jump and it is by Norman Parkinson. So it's, it's just a woman on the beach who is jumping off the pier. I've had people ask me like, is that you? I'm like, no, it's not me. So you weren't on the dive team at Georgetown? <laughs> Definitely not, no. <laughs> Allie Gorman, you do great work for us. It's great to have you. Thanks for joining me on the True Philadelphia podcast. Thanks, Matt. Good to see you, too.
Thanks to Allie. You can watch her weekdays on Action News. She hopes to be back working in the building soon enough. We all hope for more normalcy soon. I'm Matt O'Donnell, and this is the True Philadelphia Podcast.